In 1979, uh, Dr. Rike Gerd Hammer was diagnosed with testicular cancer. The cancer diagnosis came at a very difficult time during Dr. Hammer's life because just a few months before he was diagnosed with cancer, Dr. Hammer's son Dirk died as a result of a tragic accident. Dr. Hammer was always a healthy man. He was never seriously ill. So he immediately wondered whether his cancer could be related to the emotional stress and the emotional pain that he was suffering over the loss of his son. At this time of his life, Dr. Hammer was head internist at a cancer clinic in Germany. So he was working with cancer patients. And he started to talk to his patients. He wanted to find out if his patients, his cancer patients, had also experienced some emotional trauma before they got cancer. And he quickly learned that all of them, without exception, had suffered what we call in German New Medicine a conflict shock before they got cancer. But this, however, did not explain why Dr. Hammer's patients, and including himself, developed a very specific type of cancer. Why testicular cancer? Why breast cancer? Why colon cancer? Why lung cancer? And Dr. Hammer was determined to find out. And he had an ingenious idea. Based on the premise that all our bodily processes are controlled from our brain, Dr. Hammer obtained a brain scan of all his cancer patients. A brain scan, we have an example here, shows layers of the brain taken parallel to the base of the cranium. And Dr. Hammer compared the brain scan with his patient's medical records and their personal history. And he took particular attention to his patient's recent emotional trauma. And this is what Dr. Hammer found. Dr. Hammer found, and we're going to do this slowly, Dr. Hammer found that each cancer has its own area in the brain from where the cancer is controlled. And each cancer is linked to a very specific type of conflict shock that correlates psychologically and biologically to the same area in the brain that controls the cancer. So in other words, Dr. Hammer found a clear correlation between certain conflicts, how these conflicts manifest themselves on the organ level as cancer, and how all this is connected to the brain. So he found, for example, that lung cancer is always controlled from a very specific area in the brain stem, which is the oldest part of the brain, and that lung cancer is always linked to a death fright conflict. Glandular breast cancer, so a, a, a cancer in the breast glands, on the other hand, is always controlled from a very specific area in the so-called cerebellum, which is just next to the brain stem. And glandular breast cancer is always caused by, as Dr. Hammer calls it, a nest worry conflict. So uh, unexpected concern and worries about the well-being of a loved one. Introductal breast cancer, on the other hand, he found is always controlled from a very specific area in the so-called cerebrum. And introductal breast cancer is always caused, so he found, by a separation conflict. Well, animals, aren't they wonderful? Uh, animals experience these conflicts in real terms. For example, when they're separated from their mate, from their offspring, when they are attacked by an opponent, when they lose their nest or their territory, when they uh, suffer a threat of starvation or a death fright. While we humans developed over time a figurative way of thinking, so we can suffer this conflict in a transposed sense. So we can experience such conflict, for example, a territorial conflict, when we lose our home or our workplace. We can suffer a attack conflict when we are physically attacked, verbally attacked, or when our integrity is attacked. 
We can suffer a starvation conflict when we don't know how to provide for ourselves. And we can suffer a death fright conflict most often, and a typical death fright is a diagnosis shock. And Dr. Hammer found, or as we would say, since this conflict involves our entire organism, so the psyche, the brain, and the organ, and since we share these conflicts with all other species, we speak in German New Medicine of biological conflicts rather than of psychological conflicts. Well, after Dr. Hammer has identified what type of conflict cause what type of cancer, he naturally looked at other so-called diseases. He looked at heart conditions, skin disorders, liver disorders, diabetes, arthritis, and so forth. But he also looked at uh, mood disorders like depression or mental disorders, as we call it, bipolar disorders. And Dr. Hammer found that this interplay, that this interaction between the psyche, the brain, and the organ applies to all of medicine and each patient's case. And Dr. Hammer called his findings the five biological laws of the new medicine. Dr. Hammer called them biological law because his discoveries reveal universal biological principles that apply to every living organism, to every species, and to every human being. Dr. Hammer calls the, his discoveries biological laws because these biological laws reveal that diseases are not, as we assumed, the result of a malfunctioning organism, but that, the, that diseases are instead meaningful biological processes which are comprehensible in the context of our evolution and how our organism developed over time. And the five biological laws also reveal that diseases are curable. Firmly tied into the science of embryology, Dr. Hammer uh, provides the scientific evidence that we are all born with the capability to heal our own diseases. That the healing of cancer and all other diseases is inherent in all of us. And this implies, my friends, that we do no longer have to fear diseases, that we don't no, do no longer have to panic when we get cancer. Because, as Dr. Hammer puts it so well, many of us will at one time or another experience a conflict and get cancer. But that is a normal part of life and not such a bad thing at all. Once one understands the principles of the five biological laws. And we're going to look into those laws now. Okay, the first biological law states that every disease originates from a conflict shock that catches us completely off guard. So this is already important information because such a conflict shock is an emotionally unexpected and uh, emotional distress, an unexpected emotional distress for which we are not prepared and which we could not anticipate. And as such, this conflict shock differs greatly from everyday stress or emotional stress that we can foresee. Dr. Hammer calls this conflict shock, this unexpected conflict shock, a DHS which stands for Dirk Hammer Syndrome. He called it a DHS, obviously, in uh, honor of his son Dirk, whose tragic death was the cause why Dr. Hammer himself developed cancer. So let's see how this plays out in details. The moment we suffer such a conflict shock, the conflict shock impacts in a very specific in fact, in a predetermined area in the brain. And we see on a brain scan the impact of this shock as a set of sharp concentric rings. 
the location, so in other words, where exactly in the brain the conflict uh, hits or impacts is determined by the nature of the conflict. So if we learned already a little bit, a separation conflict always impacts in a very specific area in the so-called cerebrum, while a death fright conflict always impacts in the area, in a specific area in the old brain, specifically in the brain stem. How does this play out on the organ level? Well, the moment the brain receives the shock, conflict shock, the shock is instantly communicated to the corresponding organ and instantly a significant biological special program is activated that assists, and I underline, that assists our organism in coping with the particular conflict situation. So in other words, Dr. Hammer identified the brain as the mediator between the psyche and the body. He identified the brain as the control station from which each and every biological program is controlled and coordinated. In German New Medicine, we view the psyche, the brain, and the organ as three levels of one unified organism. And we will keep in mind that it is the psyche that is the driving and the leading component of that program. Very important point. Such a conflict shock is, of course, a very subjective event. It's a very personal event. So how we perceive and experience this conflict shock is determined by our individual perception of this conflict situation, by our attitude, by our vulnerabilities, by our expectation, by our values and our beliefs. In other words, it is our subjective mode that determines what, how we perceive the conflict and consequently what symptoms will manifest themselves as a result of the shock. Let's look at an example, and I'm using this example so we really understand the difference between a psychological conflict and a biological conflict. Let's say, for example, a woman is all of a sudden unexpectedly faced with the situation that her husband wants a divorce. Well, this is no doubt a separation scenario, let's call it. It is a separation scenario, but this does not necessarily mean that the woman suffers a separation conflict in biological terms. She can also perceive that situation as a loss conflict, which will involve her ovaries. She can experience the situation as a starvation conflict, if she will no longer know how to provide for, provide for herself. She can suffer the conflict or experience is as an abandonment conflict which will involve her kidneys. Or, let's say, as a self-devaluation conflict which involves her bones. Well, whether the woman develops osteoporosis, ovarian cancer, liver cancer, or if she starts gaining weight when an abandonment conflict is involved, that is determined what she subconsciously associates with that particular situation. But as soon as this association is made, the conflict-related significant biological program is instantly activated. And the biological purpose of this biological program is to put her entire organism, so the, entire, the organism as a whole, into a state that facilitates a conflict resolution. And this, my friends, is the new medical paradigm. This is what Dr. Hammer found. If more tissue is required to facilitate a conflict resolution, the conflict-related organ will respond to the conflict with cell proliferation. So let's look, for example, at lung cancer. Well, the lung, so Dr. Hammer discovered, identified, are linked uh, to a death fright conflict. 
because in biological terms, the death panic is equated with not being able to breathe. So the moment that death fright occurs, the lung alveoli cells, which are in charge of processing oxygen, will immediately start to proliferate and to multiply, forming lung nodules or a lung cancer. And the biological purpose of the lung cancer is to allow the individual or put the individual into a better position to cope with the death fright by increasing the capacity of the lungs. While we can suffer such uh, death frights or death frights can be suffered during any life-threatening situation, but as you probably understand, one of the most common death frights is a diagnosis shock, particularly a cancer diagnosis shock. So this brain scan here shows the impact of such a death fright conflict in the area of the brain stem that controls the lungs. In other words, every person who has lung cancer shows on the brain scan the impact in this particular area of the brain. In other words, it is from this area of the brain from where the lung cancer program, as we want to call it, is coordinated and controlled. So it is the death panic, it is the cancer fright, it is the cancer death panic, as I'd like to call it, that is the real reason why lung cancer is the most common cancer. And it has nothing to do with smoking. We're going to talk about toxins a little bit later. Conventional medicine calls uh, such a lung cancer, these lung nodules, a malignant cancer or a malignant growth. But we have to realize that the term malignant used by conventional medicine is an artificial term that only indicates that the cell proliferation has exceeded an arbitrary limit. If the cell proliferation is below this limit, then the tumor is called benign. But if we learn to understand that a lung cancer is a meaningful biological process that has been successfully practiced for millions of years of evolution, then we also realize and learn to understand that the distinction between benign and malignant is actually pointless. So in German new medicine, we call the phase during which this meaningful cell proliferation takes place the conflict active phase. So other biologically meaningful cancers, just like lung cancer, are for example colon cancer, liver cancer, pancreas cancer, kidney cancer, uterus cancer, prostate cancer, and glandular breast cancer, to name a few, and we're going to talk, of course, later uh, in more details about the glandular breast cancer. And Dr. Hammer also found that this meaningful cell proliferation, in other words, these significant biological programs of these specific types of cancer, are all controlled exclusively from the so-called old brain. And Dr. Hammer found that the exact opposite principle is the case with all organs and tissues that are controlled from the cerebrum. So the point is, or the principle is, if less tissue is required to facilitate a conflict resolution, the conflict-related organ will respond to the shock, to the conflict, with tissue loss, so the opposite of cell proliferation. So let's look at an example. And this is always good uh, to, uh, it's very, um, you know, uh, obvious how this, we can explain this. Let's look at the cervix. The cervix is the passageway to the uterus. And the Dr. Hammer found that the cervix or the conflict linked to the cervix is a sexual conflict of not being able to mate. While in nature a female can suffer such a conflict if mating is interrupted or doesn't take place for one or the other reason. 
Well, if this is the case, the cervix, so the cervix, the passageway to the uterus, immediately starts to ulcerate, causing tissue loss. And the biological purpose of the tissue loss is to widen the cervix, so when mating finally takes place, more sperm can reach the uterus, which enhances the chance of conception. Dr. Hammer found that we women, or women in general, can suffer these conflicts as well. So for us, this translates, for example, into sexual rejection, sexual frustration, sexual abuse, or anything shocking in regards to sexuality. So we see the tissue loss serves the purpose uh, to facilitate the conflict resolution. With other uh, biologically meaningful tissue loss programs are linked to our skin, for example, to the stomach lining, to the lining of our bronchial tubes, to the bile duct lining, the lining of the pancreatic ducts, thyroid ducts, and milk ducts, just to name a few. This is uh, what we call the biological compass of German new medicine. And let's look at that. Look what we have already learned. We learned that all old brain control tissue generate during the conflict active phase cell augmentation, cell proliferation, let's say as, an, as in form of a tumor. While all cerebrum control tissue or new brain control tissue generate during the conflict active phase a meaningful, so biologically purposeful a tissue loss or cell loss. This takes us now to the second biological law. The second biological law states that every biologically special program, you see we don't use the term disease any longer, we call this a biological program. So the second biological program states that every disease or every special program runs in two phases provided there is a resolution to the conflict. And as we already learned, this uh, program runs parallel on all three levels, on the level of the psyche, the brain, and the organ. So let's see how this all plays out as far as our nervous system is concerned. So let's look what we see here. Before we have a DHS, before we have a conflict shock, our nervous system, or we, are in a state of normotonia. Normotonia means that we are in a normal day and night rhythm where sympathicotonia alternates with vagotonia. These are terms that relate to our autonomic nervous system, and all it says is that during the day we are sympathicotonic, our heart rate is up, our muscles are going, we are in a normal state of stress. After five o'clock in the afternoon, we go into natural or normal vagotonia, which is the time where our mind, our body needs to rest. We're in a natural state of rest. And Dr. Hammer found the moment we suffer a DHS or a conflict shock, this normal day and night rhythm is instantly interrupted and we enter what we call the conflict active phase, which is a prolonged sympathicotonic state, a prolonged state of stress. And when we resolve the conflict, CL stands for conflictolysis or conflict resolution. We enter the healing phase or a prolonged state of vagotonia, a prolonged state of rest. So let's look into more detail. Well, we have all been there many, many times. Typically, when we are conflict active, we are totally preoccupied with the conflict. We can't think of anything else. We can't focus on anything else. All we do is to dwell and think about what took place. So we are totally preoccupied with the conflict. We can't sleep and we can't eat. 
But we have to realize that the extra waking hours of waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and start thinking about the conflict and that this focus on the conflict and um, the extra waking hours serve the biological purpose or have the significance to um, give us enough time or extra time to think about the conflict and find a resolution as quickly as possible. We call the conflict uh, active phase also the cold phase because when we are in the state of stress, our blood vessels are constricted and as a result we have cold hands, we have cold extremities. So typically all cold symptoms like the shivers or cold sweats only occur during the healing phase. Well, the moment we resolve the conflict, we enter the healing phase. Okay? So, typically, when we are healing, uh, we are very tired. Fatigue is always an indication that a natural healing uh, process is taking its course. The healing phase is a, natu is a vagotonic, a prolonged vagotonic state. It is, in simple terms, like resting after a big battle. So we are very tired and there is a biological purpose and the reason why we are very tired because we need to rest, we need to sleep as much as possible so we can support the organism, the body while healing takes place. So let's see what, yeah, warm phase, very important. We call the healing phase also the warm phase because the blood vessels are widened. Okay? Now we have hot hands, we have fever potentially, so all the hot symptoms, including inflammation, typically occur during the healing phase. So let's look now what happens on the healing phase, in the healing phase on the organ level, and this is most fascinating. The moment the conflict is resolved, all tumors or a tumor that grows during the conflict active phase instantly stops growing. But not only that, the moment the conflict is resolved, the tumor not only stops growing, but the tumor is now decomposed and broken down with the help of specialized microbes that have been trained over the course of evolution to do exactly that. And this takes us to the fourth biological law and the beneficial role of microbes. When our body, our organism developed over time, microbes developed with our organism. And the biological purpose or the function of the organism is to maintain our tissue and keep our body in a healthy state. And Dr. Hammer made two other important discoveries. Dr. Hammer found that these microbes that populate our organism are only active during the healing phase. So during the conflict active phase, they are dormant, they are inactive. But the moment the uh, related conflict is resolved, the uh, microbes instantly start the work that was assigned to them. Because Dr. Hammer also found that the manner and the style in which these microbes work are in full accordance with evolutionary logic. And this is what he found. He found that fungi, like Candida albicans, we're all aware of them, like fungi or mycobacteria, like tubercular bacteria, are the oldest microbes. So consequently, they only populated the oldest tissue that is controlled from the oldest part of the brain. And the moment the organ-related conflict is resolved, these fungi and TB bacteria begin to remove the tumor. In other words, these fungi and TB bacteria have been trained over the course of evolution to remove the tumor. In order to understand this even better, we have to realize the following. The tumor that grows during the active phase, like a lung tumor, like a colon tumor, like a liver tumor. So a tumor that, grow, that grows during the conflict active phase consists of what we would call disposable cells. 
because these cells are only meant to be there for the time being. They're only there to facilitate a conflict resolution and in fact improve the function on the, of the organ during the conflict active time. And these disposable cells, they look in size and in shape different from the, ori from the original cells and that is important because the tubercular bacteria, they recognize them as different and decompose only those. In fact, it gets even better than that. In fact, the moment we have the conflict, the moment the DHS occurs, the tubercular bacteria multiply parallel to the tumor growth. The TB bacteria, they multiply at the same rate as the tumor grows so that when the conflict is resolved, there will be the sufficient of amount of bacteria available to decompose the tumor. So now, of course, we are seeing symptoms, okay? So in the conflict active phase, there's never a symptom. There is a tumor, there is a growth, but we will never hear about people with a liver tumor or a, 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 a lung tumor or so forth that they have any pain or anything. They don't feel the tumor at all, okay? But this changes the moment the conflict is resolved and we go to the person goes into healing. Because the remnants of the tumor, so uh, the remnants of this decomposing process have to be eliminated, causing discharge. So tubercular discharge is therefore typically expelled uh, when a lung cancer is in healing, it is expelled through the sputum. When a colon tumor is being removed and decomposed, the discharge and the tubercular discharge is then in the stool. If a kidney tumor or a prostate tumor is being removed, the tubercular discharge is in the urine. Often, this um, decomposing process and breaking down the tumor process, so to speak, is uh, uh, um, accompanied with, with blood loss. There is potentially blood in the discharge because we have to realize it is a, as I like to call it, a construction site. And these uh, small capillaries, they break easily, causing bleeding. Of course, bleeding also always has to be watched, but how important it is to understand that all this when there's blood in the discharge is a part of a healing process that is taking place. Another typical uh, symptom that occurs in the healing phase when tubercular bacteria evolved in, uh, involved are night sweats. So if there is a big tumor that has to be decomposed, these night sweats can be excessive. So it, again, how important is it to know that night sweats are not a bad sign. On the contrary, we now know that there is a healing process underway and that tubercular bacteria are in the picture. Okay. So if we don't have the tubercular bacteria, if we don't carry the TB bacteria or the fungi because of an overuse of antibiotics, what is the consequence? The result, as a result of not carrying these bacteria or fungi, the tumor cannot be decomposed and encapsulates. And such an encapsulated tumor can, as you can imagine, be found years later through a routine checkup. For example, through a lung x-ray, a mammogram, a colonoscopy, and so forth, right? And then, of course, it can cause new shocks, it can cause di uh, cancer shocks, and as a result, new cancers. So it is important what the biological process here is and that we realize why the tumor cannot be decomposed. So what we also have to realize is that healing always occurs in a fluid environment. So there's always swelling. There always also edema in the area that is in, heal, is in the healing process. So we see swelling during the healing phase. Swelling typically, typically causes pain. Easily, you know, there can be inflammation during the healing phase and fatigue and fever. So if we look at all these symptoms, discharge, pus, night sweat, swelling, pain, inflammation, fever, fatigue, we usually think that something is wrong, that we are sick. But it's quite the opposite is the case. Something is perfectly right and we are now in a healing process, in a natural healing process.
So people often ask me, say, so what is GNM therapy? Well, my friends, the symptoms, the past, the discharge, the nights with the swelling, the pain and the inflammation is already the natural healing that is taking place. And as Dr. Hammer puts it so beautifully, if the patient has been made aware of all the facts, he will no longer need to get frightened by his symptoms. He can now fully accept these as the healing symptoms they are, all of which had until now caused fear and panic. In the greatest number of cases, the whole episode will pass without any serious consequences. So the role of the GNM practitioner is to assist the patient during the healing phase, during the healing process, right? To assist him. A German new medicine practitioner uh, will know how to support the healing process without interfering in it. Uh, also, by understanding the entire process, gentle interventions can be planned in order to slow down a severe healing phase or more intense healing phase and on top of it, um, uh, potential complications can be anticipated and can be addressed before they reach a critical point. Well, with the patient and the doctor, the practitioner working together, this healing phase can in fact be a life-affirming experience for both of them. So let's look now from what we have learned to the so-called immune system. So let's look about the immune system from, based on Dr. Hammer's discovery that cancer is not a malignant disease but a meaningful biological process and that microbes are in fact uh, beneficial as they help us in the healing phase, in this case as we learn, to decompose a tumor. Well, what is the immune system? According to conventional medicine, the immune system is a defense system against microbes and cancer cells. Thus, according to the theory, a weak immune system increases the risk of infectious diseases, we hear this all the time, and of developing cancer. Well, medical science views the immune system, or views, I should say, our body as a battlefield where white blood cells are ready to attack the enemy. In fact, daffodils are now, symbolically of course, also turned into weapons in order to fight cancer. But my friends, if we learn to understand that cancer is a meaningful process, that microbes are our loyal, loyal helpers, then the entire construct of an immune system falls apart. There is no immune system. The mean immune system does not exist. What exists, however, is a perfect biological system created to support us while we are healing. And that includes the supportive function of white blood cells, of antibodies, and many other biochemical processes. You see Dr. Hammer puts everything on its head. Because if we learn that diseases are meaningful, that these are programs that have been practiced over millions of years, we realize that most theories of conventional medicine are based on assumptions that have actually never been substantiated. So let's look further. So what have we learned? We learned that all old brain control tissue cause cell augmentation during the conflict active phase, causing cer the certain uh, tumors to develop. And during the healing phase, these tumors are decomposed with the help of tubercular bacteria or fungi only, exclusively with those type of bacteria. And we learned that all new brain control tissue generates a meaningful tissue loss in order to facilitate a conflict resolution. So let's see what happens now on the organ level of these tissues that cause tissue loss during the active phase. 
Remember we talked about the cervix related to a sexual conflict that causes during the active phase tissue loss and widening of the cervix in order to facilitate the conflict resolution. So let's see what happens during the healing phase. Well, the moment the conflict is resolved, the tissue loss, in other words, the ulcerated area, is refilled and replenished with new cells. And it is the cell proliferation that is now diagnosed as a cancer. Because of the cell proliferation, it is diagnosed as a malignant cancer. So here we find, for example, cervical cancer, right? as a healing phase of the cervix in healing as a result of having resolved a sexual conflict. But Dr. Hammer clearly shows that the cell proliferation is nothing malignant, that such a tumor is not malignant at all, but this tumor is in fact a good sign that the tumor is now in the healing process, that the tissue loss is refilled and replenished. So nothing malignant about this. And because of the healing nature of these tumors, Dr. Hammer calls this type of tumors a curative cancer or curative cancers. Other curative cancers of this type, a bronchial cancer, lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, ovarian cancer, testicular cancer, introductal breast cancer, but also we find here skin rashes, bronchitis, laryngitis, hemorrhoids, and many other conditions that are basically organs controlled from the new brain, and they are all linked to very specific type of conflicts that Dr. Hammer has discovered. And of course, typically in the healing phase again, we see swelling, there is typically pain, potentially inflammation and fever, and of course also fatigue. Again, all signs that a natural healing is taking place. So one important point to point out is the following that the cell proliferation, so refilling the tissue loss uh, during the healing phase only takes place during the first phase of healing. After this so-called epileptoid crisis, which I will explain in a moment, uh, the, uh, the tumor basically uh, degrades and slowly, slowly degrades and calcifies. And at the end of the program, the tumor is basically gone and all we see is scar tissue and often also scar tissue on the psyche, if I may say it this way. Okay, we're going to go to the brain level and see how these programs run on the brain level. Eh? We have learned that on the psychological level during the conflict active phase, we are preoccupied with the conflict, we can't sleep, we can't eat, right? We are totally focused on the conflict. On the conflict-related organ, we see either a tumor growth or tissue loss, depending what tissue is involved, in order to help us on the organ level to cope with the conflict and facilitate a conflict resolution. So let's see what happens on the brain level. Well, during the active phase, all we see is on a CT scan the sharp target ring configuration in the area of the brain that is involved. Physically, so on the brain level is such, physically, there is absolutely no symptom. But this changes immediately when we go into healing because Healing also occurs now on the brain level. And as we learn, healing always occurs in a fluid environment, so the same applies to the brain. So during the first part of healing, there is water and serous fluid drawn to the area in the brain that is in healing. And this fluid, this serous fluid and water that accumulates at this area causes or creates a so-called brain edema. Okay. So this brain edema, however, is important because uh, the edema provides basically a water pocket, a water cushion that protects the area in the brain while it's healing. So we have to realize that such an edema is not only in the area of the brain that is in healing, but also on the corresponding uh, organ or tissue that is in healing at the same time.
So that is why the phase A of healing is the most difficult part because this is where there is the swelling and the pain on the organ level and the brain edema causes the typical cerebral healing symptoms like headaches, dizziness and blurry vision. But you can imagine the, the more intense the conflict active phase, the bigger the impact in the brain in the active phase, the bigger is the brain edema. And this is a very good picture. On the brain scan, the brain edema shows as dark, as black. This is a very good example. Well, at the height of the healing phase, a very important event takes place, which is the so-called epileptoid crisis. So what is that? Well, at the height of the healing phase, the brain from that area that is in healing, so from the center of here, the brain triggers a sympathicotonic spike that puts the entire organism back into conflict activity with the typical symptoms like shivers, the cold sweats, nervousness, restlessness. So what is the reason for that? What is the purpose of that? But nothing in nature happens by chance. The biological purpose is the following. At the height of the healing phase, or we can also say at the deepest point of vagotonia, this brain edema has reached its maximum size. And exactly at this point, this sympathicotonic stress push presses the edema out. And that is a very important counter-regulation because now the edema on the brain, in the brain level, on the brain level, and as well as the edema on the healing organ can now be expelled. So well, after the epicrisis, we have therefore a urinary phase, which means that now the water can be expelled and we pee a lot. So we can now uh, basically uh, verify this from now on. So if all of a sudden we have a night where we get up and have to go to the washroom a couple of times, uh, although we haven't drank a lot the morning before, okay? So that is when such an epic crisis has taken place. Usually, the often the epic crisis takes place in the early morning hours because this is when we are in natural vagotonia and this is of course the ideal time for the epicrisis. Um, epicrisis can manifest itself in different ways. Typical epicrisis symptoms or events I should say are heart attacks, uh, strokes, asthma attacks, migraine attacks, epileptic seizure, and as we of course understand, all these type of crises of epicrisis are linked to very specific organs and therefore to very specific type of conflicts. And that's why I said before, the, the GNM practitioner that is familiar and works with Dr. Amos work who is, uh, you know, has studied it, will know exactly what type of epicrisis can be expected and we can uh, you know, anticipate this and, and take steps to uh, hopefully as prevent this uh, as much as possible if it's a big epicrisis that we're waiting for. But we have these epicrisis um, events uh, quite often in a small version, absolutely. So let's look now what happens in the healing phase. Well, as soon as the brain edema is pressed out, glia cells, so-called neuroglia, moves to the area in the brain that is being repaired and finishes the repair job. So you can imagine, if there is a long conflict active phase with a big brain impact in the brain causing a large brain edema, there is a lot of repair work that has to be done. So a lot of glia will accumulate at the site. And it is this accumulation of glia, it is this glia pockets that conventional medicine diagnoses or labels as a brain tumor. And Dr. Hammer has established and demonstrated already in the early 80s that, there is, that such a brain tumor is not at all a malignant growth 
On the contrary, what Dr. Hammer shows and what we already clearly understand is that such a brain tumor indicates a healing process on the brain level parallel to the healing on the corresponding organ. Okay? So whenever there is healing going on on the organ level, yeah, from a common cold to hemorrhoids to a cancer, we see during phase B of healing these glia pockets in the brain if a brain scan is taken. And of course, the size of these so-called brain tumors is determined how intense the program is. And just a couple of sentences here. This is, shows us the preventive aspect of value of German new medicine. Because now that we know when we are conflict active, because we have the cold hands, we are preoccupied with the conflict, we wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and start thinking of it. Now we know it's time I should resolve this conflict as soon as possible. If we are constrained because we can leave our workplace, we can leave a difficult relationship, we should try, as we call it, to downgrade the conflict. Downgrading means to minimize the conflict mass because Remember, the psyche, the brain, and the organ work as one unit, and it is the psyche that is the leading component of the unit. So if we downgrade this emotionally and psychologically, then the program will be lighter, so to speak, not as intensive, and we can prevent more difficult healing phases and healing symptoms. Okay, next. Okay, what have we learned? This is basically how we can summarize the fifth biological law. The fifth biological law states that every so-called disease is part of a significant biological program created to assist the organism in coping with a biological conflict. Okay? So what did we learn? We learned that all old brain control tissue cause cell augmentation in the active phase. The tumor is broken down during the healing phase. All new brain control tissue cause a meaningful tissue loss, which is refilled and replenished during the healing phase. How come? What is the reason why certain tumors, certain cancers, grow during the conflict active phase of all old brain control tissues, so in the active phase, and other tumors basically develop during the healing phase when the organ is controlled from the new brain? And Dr. Hammer found the answer in the science of embryology, and we're going to look at this now. This is a beautiful quote. The science of embryology and our knowledge of the evolution of man is the foundation of medicine. They are the two sources that reveal to us the nature of cancer and of all so-called diseases. So let's look at this in more details. This is absolutely fascinating. This is a blastocyst. A blastocyst contains a cluster of cells from which the embryo develops. On the 13th day after conception, in other words, 13 days after the fertilization of the egg, the blastocyst uh, divides into three embryonic germ layers, which is the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. And it is from these three germ layers from which all our organs and tissues developed. In fact, we have to point out and realize that when the fetus develops in the womb, or the fetus develops, that the fetus uh, passes all the evolutionary stages from one, from a single-celled organism, to a complete human being. And we're going to look at this now in details. Okay, the endoderm develops all the organs of the intestinal canal or the alimentary canal from the mouth to the rectum. The endoderm also develops the liver, the pancreas, uh, the lungs, the prostate, and the uterus. From an ev evolutionary point of view, the endoderm is the oldest germ layer. And that is why all organs and tissues that, are de that derive from the endoderm are controlled from the oldest part of the brain. 
and all these tissues that derive from the endoderm and are controlled from the oldest part of the brain are the same cell type. They are all so-called adenocells. And in full accordance with evolutionary logic, all organs that derive from the oldest germ layer relate or are linked to the oldest biological conflicts. Conflicts that relate to breathing, procreation, and food, literally or figuratively. And what we have learned is that all organs that are controlled from the brain stem, they generate exclusively cell augmentation or a tumor growth during the conflict active phase. And during the healing phase, the tumor is broken down with the help of mycobacteria and fungi that are the oldest microbes that populated the oldest tissue that is controlled from the oldest part of the brain and that derives from the oldest germ layer. See, we have a system. The mesoderm develops our underskin, the corium skin, the skin underneath the epidermis. It also develops um, uh, the, uh, the breast glands, the pleura, the ovaries, the testicles, the spleen, bones, muscles, and other tissue. And all tissues and organs that originate from the mesoderm are co controlled from either the cerebrum or from the cerebral medulla, which is the interior part of the cerebrum. At a late, later time during evolution, we developed a second skin, which is the epidermis, which covers entirely the underskin. And the skin, the epidermis, derives from the ectoderm. The, ect the, the skin is, consists of squamous epithelial tissue. And over the course of evolution, the squamous epithelial tissue also migrated into the mouth and into the rectum. It lined all the canals and ducts in our system. It lined the pancreas ducts and the bile ducts. It lined the stomach and so forth. And being the youngest tissue type that derives from the youngest germ layer, all these organs and tissues that derive from the ectoderm are exclusively controlled from the youngest part of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex. And accordingly, these tissues relate to more advanced biological conflicts like separation conflicts, territorial conflicts, identity conflicts, and so forth. And all these tissues, as we have learned, they generate exclusively, they generate a meaningful tissue loss during the conflict active phase, which is refilled and replenished during the healing phase. So Dr. Hammer's discoveries, as we so beautifully see, they provide us with a complete biological system that explains not only the cause, but also the natural healing of diseases in the context of how our organism developed over time. And the beautiful thing is, that this complete biological system does not only apply to us humans, all species, whether fish, reptile, mammal, or humans, respond to the same type of biological conflict with the same biological program. In other words, every species responds to a death right conflict with the proliferation of lung cells. Every mammal responds, or female mammal, responds to a nest worry conflict with the proliferation of breast gland cells. Last thing before the quick break. Based on what we have learned, based on that cancer and diseases are not something to out to kill us, right? If nature were designed to produce cancer cells in our body to kill the organism, we would not be sitting here, right? So let's look from that new understanding based on this new paradigm to the question if toxins can, in fact, cause cancer. While the theory that toxins cause cancer is a widespread belief, and it also causes a lot of fear, adding to the fear that is already associated with cancer. 
While this does not say, or we are not suggesting, that toxins are harmless. Toxins in our food, in our environment, environmental toxins, smoking, etc., of course deplete the body, deplete our organism of energy, which means that we are more susceptible to suffer a conflict shock, and also a, de a, a body depleted of energy uh, has a much more difficult time to in the healing phase. There are also so-called neurotoxins that are in dental fillings and in vaccines. And absolutely, this neurotoxin can cause severe nerve damage and neurological disorders. But, my friends, and this is the point, toxins cannot cause cancer. And this is why. The theory that toxins cause cancer is uh, based on the assumption that cancer is a malignant disease. But if we learn that cancer is not malignant but a, a meaningful biological process, then we also understand that toxins can cause cancer. Also, when we learn to understand that cancer originates in the psyche and that each cancer is controlled from a very certain area in the brain that acts as a mediator between the psyche and the body, then we also understand that toxins cannot cause cancer. Dr. Hammer's discoveries also explain why people that live a very healthy lifestyle, that follow a healthy diet and try to stay away as much as possible from toxin, still get cancer. And this often at a very early age. I know this is something to digest, but we just have to look at the, at the science. Yes.